And I, I do want to say just one little word before I get started. It's I think it, there's something deeply providential about the fact that um, Father Thomas got stuck in Frankfurt because I think that's God's gift to me because I love methodology, right? And so I love things going in their proper order. And the fact that I get to go before Father Thomas means that we are going in the proper order. Because <laughs> from now on, now that you've had an introduction to the person of St. Thomas, his life and his works, now we get to move precisely in the sort of order that St. Thomas would have wanted us to move in. So we're gonna move from the general to the particular, from the abstract to the applied. So my two talks on metaphysics are, are about metaphysics, but they're also gonna give us a really big picture of the structure of kind of philosophy in general for Aquinas and what his big picture of the intellectual life was. And then with each progressive talk, we're gonna get more and more applied moving from the abstract of metaphysics into the philosophy of nature, into particular questions in natural philosophy and contemporary science from its mystic perspective. So um, thank God Father Thomas got stuck. Okay, uh, let me start with a prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Father in heaven, we ask that you would pour down upon us the grace and the gift of your Holy Spirit to enkindle in our hearts the fire of your love and illuminate our minds with the light of your truth, so that in all things we may come to know you truly, love you deeply, and praise you worthily through Christ our Lord. Amen. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Okay, so this talk is called Metaphysics. I added, and the philosophy of nature. So basically you can see these two talks really as one very long talk. Um, the first part of it, this talk, is kind of looking from metaphysics down towards philosophy of nature. The next part is gonna be looking at metaphysics up towards God. Um, so another way that you can think about this talk is the subtitle a Thomistic approach to dividing the philosophical or just academic disciplines in general. So I wanna start with a very basic question. That is a right click, not a left click. What is metaphysics? Now, there are lots of ways that you might go about trying to answer that question. Here's one, is you might just pick up a really popular metaphysics textbook. So this is Jae Gwon Kim's uh, an Anthology of Metaphysics. It's probably the, the most famous, most used collection of metaphysical articles. So basically what it does is it collects all of the most important articles written in English, so in Anglophone philosophy, over the last hundred years, and it groups them by topic. Um, so if you want to know, know what sort of English speakers have been doing in metaphysics in the last hundred years, this is the touchstone resource. So what do you find if you open up Kim's metaphysics? Well, you'll find articles about ontology. So that's trying to answer the question, what is there? Or broadly, what sorts of things are there? What exists? You'll also find articles on material constitution. That's the question of when do two things combine to make another thing. You'll find articles on causation. What is it for one thing to cause something else? What are the agents of causation? Do events cause other events? Do things cause other things? How does causation work? You'll find articles on diachronic identity. So that's the question of how or even whether something can remain itself even as it goes undergoes change through time. So am I the same person as the little boy or the infant that my mother gave birth to? You'll find articles about modality. So this has to do with the nature and the epistemic access we have to things like necessity, possibility, or impossibility. And you'll find articles on time. So if you don't know anything about kind of the, the theories or metaphysics of time, I won't get into that stuff, but so you'll find articles comparing the virtues and the merits and demerits of A theory versus B theory or presentism or, or, or eternalism or growing block theory. Um, all of these things you will find contained in that very thick book. Okay, we might wonder, but what actually is metaphysics? Um, it seems like we haven't yet answered the question. And I think that's actually exactly right. We haven't yet answered the question. So consider an analogy. Suppose I were to ask you, what is a human being? 
Well, here's a really bad answer you could give me. You could say, well, a human being is Father Simon or Molly or Father Philip Neri or me or Father Mariusz. You could just sort of list a bunch of humans you know and say, that's, that's what a human being is. Here's a slightly better answer that's still pretty bad. You might say, well, a human being is, and then insert a big disjunctive list of every human being there's ever been. So that's answer one plus Julius Caesar or Jesus or Genghis Khan, right? And just insert all the human beings there have ever been. If that were your answer to what is a human being, it would still be a bad one. It would be better than the first, still bad. Here's a third answer you could give that is better, but still bad. You might say, well, a human being is, and then insert a gigantic disjunctive list, not just of every human being, whoever was, is, or will be, but of every human being there ever could be. So it's true, that would definitely cover your basis from an extensional point of view, right? Um, if you could actually fill in all the blanks on that disjunctive list, then you will have given every instance of a right answer. You still wouldn't have told us what a human being is. The problem with all of these list-like disjunctive List-like answers, or sometimes in, in logic and, and mathematics, these will be called disjunctive definitions. Um, the problem with these disjunctive definitions or list-like answers is that all they do is they tell you what counts as a human being. They don't tell you why those things count as human beings. They don't tell you what it is to be a human being. The same thing is true for metaphysics. So when we list topics like ontology, diachronic identity, material constitution, modality, all of those things we might think count as metaphysical, but that's not enough. It's not enough just to list the things that in a contemporary textbook are counted as metaphysics. What we need to do is figure out what, if anything, is common to all of them that unites them so as to make those metaphysical topics, as opposed to some other kind of topic. When we have that in mind, and we go back to Jaeguan Kim's anthology, the Thomist certainly, and in fact, most contemporary metaphysicians will get a little worried. Because when we look at this list of topics, it sure looks like there isn't actually anything that unites them. There's no common feature or common trait that all of these topics have in virtue of which they might be called metaphysical. So just to sort of um, anticipate where we're going a little bit from a Thomistic point of view, these topics, material constitution, diachronic and identity and time are in fact not metaphysical topics. Those are topics that belong to what the Thomist would, would call the philosophy of nature. So from a Thomistic perspective, you open up Jaeguan Kim's anthology of metaphysics, and this looks puzzling. But it's not just from a Thomistic perspective that this looks puzzling. It's from pretty much any perspective that this is going to look puzzling. So here, I want to take a little bit of a historical detour, and I'm going to call this the unity problem. Because it turns out that the question of the unity of metaphysics is not unique to contemporary English speakers, right? It's not just that like people in the analytic philosophical tradition have gone totally off the rails and are saddled with this problem that no other philosophical tradition has. In fact, we've all got a unity problem. So from the perspective of ancient philosophy, you can start with kind of the beginning. So Aristotle, variously described what he called first philosophy or the premier philosophy as the science of being, the science of substance, the science of first principles, the science of divine things, and cryptically, the science we are seeking. If those don't obviously strike you as the same, you're in good company because pretty much everyone both inside and outside the Aristotelian tradition, which is a long tradition, thought those don't look the same. Unity problem. 
Even after Aristotle, in the Neoplatonic tradition, which might also be called the Neo-Aristotelian tradition, you get the term metaphysics, right? So there's this story about Andronicus of Rhodes who inherits maybe Aristotle's own library, maybe a library of books copied from the Lyceum, um, and he organizes it in the, in the legend. And he, he's got all these books that are books of physics, books of natural philosophy, and they line up neatly on the shelf. And then, according to the legend, he's got all these other books about substance, first principles, divine things, being, and those just go meta afterwards. Um, now, even if that story isn't true, the notion of metaphysicos makes some sense, right? All of these are topics that one would engage in or investigate after one has completed studying natural philosophy, because in some sense, these are all topics that go beyond the scope of natural philosophy which are two possible translations of the Greek meta. So unity problem is there in ancient philosophy. It's also there in medieval philosophy. So many medieval philosophers do in fact attempt to unite all these things. So some of the really shining stars in that constellation of unity are in the Islamic tradition, Avicenna and Averroes, so Ibn Sina and Ibn Rushd, and in the Latin tradition, Aquinas and Scotus. Right now, this might sound shocking, but actually, in a lot of things, Aquinas and Scotus are on the same team. Right. Um, so, particularly with regard to the unity of metaphysics, they have very different stories to tell about why it's unified, but they're at least on the same team that it is unified. Nevertheless, and this is part of the history of metaphysics and the history of philosophy that um, a lot of people don't tell, mostly because champions of scholasticism don't like it, um, and because champions of modernity don't know it. But there were actually a lot of attempts in the medieval period to divide those things and refuse to unite them. So one of my favorites is uh, this, um, this scholastic named Nicholas Bonetas, who splits metaphysics in two. He says, there's, um, there's the metaphysics, which is the science of divine things, right? So that's Aristotle's number four. And that's basically natural theology. And that's really hard and should be done last. But then there's, you know, he was a, uh, I, I resonate with him because he was a narcissistic man. He said, there's also our metaphysics, right? Um, and our metaphysics is the science of being, that's Aristotle's number one. And that's actually really easy. And you should do that first before you even do logic, before you do natural philosophy, before you do anything else, you should first do our metaphysics. So with Bonetus, and then some people do follow him and kind of riff on him, but you get attempts to divide these various elements of the, the Aristotelian unity problem. In modernity, the unity problem remains, but it takes a different form. So you get, a la Nicholas Bonetus, you get um, a division that's usually but not accurately um, attributed to Christian Wolff um, between general metaphysics and special metaphysics. So on this division, general metaphysics is kind of like Bonetus's our metaphysics. It's kind of like Aristotle's science of being. It's a really abstract, really general account of kind of the most universal things, right? The most universal concepts, the stuff that applies always and everywhere. And then special metaphysics takes up particular, very applied, very nuanced issues. So things like the existence of God, the eternity of the world that Father Simon mentioned last night, but also things like um, the immortality of the soul, free will, uh, and fate, all of those fall under special metaphysics. Um, and there's this question of, is there a connection between general metaphysics and special metaphysics? Is there anything that unifies all of those topics that fall under special metaphysics or not? And Wolf is the closest to the scholastics. You also get new ideas of what metaphysics actually is. So for John Locke, metaphysics is the becomes, gets reconceived as, along with all of philosophy, as the underlaborer of the sciences. So the task of metaphysics is nothing more and nothing less for Locke than clarifying the concepts that scientists, empirical scientists use when they're engaged in empirical science. 
Kant goes sort of the opposite direction. Um, so where, where Locke wants to make metaphysics the servant of empirical investigations, Kant reconceives of metaphysics as the a priori or, or the investigation into the a priori preconditions for any empirical study, right? So you can have famously the metaphysics of morals, right? That's the investigation for Kant into the a priori preconditions for empirical psychology empirical sociology, empirical ethics. Um, and then the same thing is going to be true for Kant for every branch of knowledge. There's going to be a metaphysic side of it that's a priori and an empirical side that's a posteriori. The last big change in modernity is, the, is that you get the development of new disciplines. So things like psychology, right, which always had been part of an Aristotelian philosophy of nature, um, and that even in like Christian Wolf um, takes up certain issues of special metaphysics like free will, free choice, um, how the mind goes through practical reasoning. That now becomes its own discipline. It sort of departs from the shore of natural philosophy and sets sail on its own. Um, it's like an adolescent emancipating him or herself from the house. So you get this fracturing over and over and over again, there's this temptation to fracture. So where does all that leave us? I think it leaves us with a fear and a hope. The fear is that it sure looks like we've got good reason to think there might be no unity to what we call metaphysics at all. In other words, the word metaphysics would be more like the class of things I have in my pocket than it would be like human being. Human being carves nature at the joints, right? It gets at the way things really are, right? So you can take, there's a real species, animal, that you can really divide into rational animals and irrational animals. The, the rational animals are the human beings, the irrational animals are the brutes, and that gets at the way the world is, right? It carves nature at the joints. What I've got in my pocket does not, right? I could put a tiny little irrational animal, in my pocket. I could also put a piece of lint in my pocket. I could also actually have keys in my pocket. And what is it that's sort of intrinsic to, essential to keys, a tiny little animal, and a piece of lint that unifies them under this one category? Nothing. They have nothing in common. Being in my pocket is totally accidental. Um, to whether something is a tiny little animal or a piece of lint or keys, right? Um, it's, it's a way of categorizing things that doesn't get the world right. If, if we tried to divide, you know, we said, what is there in the world? And I said, well, there are substances, things I have in my pocket, and things to the left of me. That's a bad way to carve up the world, right? Um, things are going to fall under those categories in lots of different ways. They might change, they might shift. They don't get at what things are. So the worry is that metaphysics might be like that. It might just be a hodgepodge of topics that happen to be grouped together because of historical accidents, right? Um, you might tell a story about how universities developed and the way that university departments developed. and you know, the philosophy department ends up being the collection of all the topics that haven't yet developed into their own rigorous sciences. That's one very common view in contemporary uh, Anglophone philosophy. Um, and what's true of philosophy in general is even more true of metaphysics there. Here's the hope. Nothing in the story that I've just told implies that the medieval attempts to unify metaphysics were wrong. All it says is that they didn't win in sort of the game of history. And it turns out that um, just because something doesn't win in the game of history doesn't mean it's wrong. And that means that medieval or specifically Thomistic approaches to metaphysics may well still be right. They might actually get the world right, get the way we think right. Um, they could carve nature at the joints. And the Thomistic account of metaphysics might end up being more like human being, right? Actually getting at the reality um, than 
what I've got in my pocket or things to my left. And such a project, if right, could still be viable. All we would have to do if we wanted to engage in that viable project is make sure that we very carefully distinguish it from contemporary metaphysics or from Kantian metaphysics or from Lockean metaphysics, right? Or any other contender that's out there. We just wanna be clear that this word metaphysics is gonna be slippery, right? And there's a danger of equivocating. So that's the hope. And so now what I wanna do is I wanna ask not what is metaphysics because that might be an equivocal term. Now I wanna ask this, what is Thomistic metaphysics? Um, what is this thing that I'm suggesting might actually get at something real and carve at the joints? Well, generally we can say that metaphysics for the Thomist is an Aristotelian science in Greek an episteme or in Latin a scientia. So two words of warning there. First, we should, we should distinguish Aristotelian science from Aristotelian dialectic. And second, we should distinguish maybe Aristotelian science from modern or contemporary science, right? The natural sciences as practiced today. The first distinction um, has to do with the certainty of the knowledge. So for Aristotle, and broadly speaking for kind of the classical um, philosophical tradition that includes ancient Greece and uh, the medieval Islamic and Latin Wests. The distinction between science and dialectic has to do with degrees of certainty, right? So the idea is this, whenever you engage in a line of thought, whenever you engage in a process of reasoning, the conclusion that you draw can never be more certain than the premises that are the basis for the conclusion. Right? So suppose you engage in the following line of reason. Um, all Dominicans are always hungry. Father Philip Neri is a Dominican. So Father Philip Neri is always hungry. That's a valid argument. It's, there's nothing wrong with the way that you reason there. So the question is just, are the premises true? And how sure are you of the premises? So there are two there, right? All Dominicans are hungry, always, and Father Philip Neri is a Dominican. Now you might think to yourself, wow, I'm really confident about premise one because I've met a lot of Dominicans and all of them are always hungry, right? Um, so real high degree of confidence on that one. But then you think, mm, that Father Philip Neri, he seems a little deceitful he might just be pretending to be a Dominican. And if he's just pretending to be a Dominican, then I can't be guaranteed that he's always hungry. Really confident that all Dominicans are hungry, but like that guy, not very confident that he's not lying to us right now, right? If that's the case, then when you draw the conclusion, Father Philip Neri is always hungry, you can only draw that conclusion with the degree of certainty that you have of the weakest premise. Right, so if you're more confident um, that all Dominicans are always hungry than you are that I am a Dominican, then you should be only as confident of your conclusion as you are of the fact that I am a Dominican. That sort of line of reasoning, that style of argumentation, um, that way of thinking is what in the Aristotelian and Platonic traditions is called dialectic. It goes like this. You reason from probable or unlikely premises to probable or unlikely conclusions. Science, Aristotelian science, right? Scientia in Latin, episteme in Greek is different. That's when we reason from necessary premises about which we are certain to necessary conclusions about which we are certain. See how that's different? So math, right? When I say, um, that um, all triangles have interior angles summing to 180 degrees, um, all everything that has interior angles summing to 180 degrees has three straight sides. Ergo, all triangles have three straight sides. If you've done like a little bit of geometry, 
you should be totally certain about both of these both of those premises which means you should be totally certain about the conclusion and you should recognize that the conclusion is necessary right there's no possible world in which that conclusion is false right there's no possible world in which a triangle doesn't have three sides that's the difference between Aristotelian science and dialectic. And dialectic. That ra then raises a question about what's the relationship between Aristotelian science and modern science? Because it sure looks like those aren't the same, right? Reasoning from necessary premises to necessary conclusions that are known with certainty seems like it's a far cry from concocting a hypothesis and then going out in the world and running experiments to test the hypothesis, right? It seems like those sorts of scientific hypotheses with which we often associate the scientific method um, after the scientific revolution, it seems like those kind of depend upon falsifiability, depend upon the possibility that they might not be true, right? I.e. they're not necessary. That's actually not the case. Right, so it's uh, to characterize the practice and the method of contemporary science, A, as if it were a single thing, and B, as if it required um, hypothesis, falsifiability, and empirical testability, all of those things are false. Um, since all of those things are false, it remains an open and very important question what the relationship is between the contemporary, uh, the contemporary practice of empirical science and the Aristotelian notion of scientia episteme science, right? It might end up being the case that they are non-overlapping but compatible. Um, okay, so generally we can say Thomistic metaphysics is an Aristotelian science. More specifically, we can say that it is the science of being as being. What does that mean? Well, we can, Specify even further and brace yourself because here comes the definition. Thomistic metaphysics is the science of common being, that is, the analogical community of substance and accidents, in potency and in act, insofar as this can be known through strictly immaterial principles. That just rolls off the tongue, right? Um, once again, metaphysics is the science of common being i.e. the analogical community of substance and accidents in potency and in act, insofar as this can be known through strictly immaterial principles. Let's break that down. So the first almost stereotypically Thomistic way to break that down is according to its form and its matter. So the material definition or the material element of the definition is this. Metaphysics is the science of common being. Metaphysics is the science of common being. And what is common being? That's one translation of ens commune in Latin. So other translations are shared being, being in general, or being in common. Um, a much looser kind of more dynamic translation would be um, participated being. Um, but that's bad. So science of being in common. What is this common being? It is the analogical community of substance and accidents in potency and in act. More on that in just a moment. The formal part of the definition is this. Metaphysics is the science of what can be known through strictly immaterial principles. Metaphysics is the science of what can be known through strictly immaterial principles. Okay, we're gonna keep breaking that down and make it a little clearer. So the material part of the definition. Metaphysics is the science of common being, that is, the analogical community of substance and accidents in potency and in act. Well, look, some things are substances, some things are accidents. Artichokes and aardvarks, ferns and felines, water and women are all substances. Positions and pains, sizes and shapes, deeds and degrees are all accidents. The way that we can now remember lists are bad ways of defining things, right? So what do these things have in common in virtue of which some are called substances and others are called accidents? 
Substances are things that naturally exist on their own. Accidents are things that naturally exist in substances. So it's true that all aardvarks always are in some position. Sometimes aardvarks are curled up. Sometimes aardvarks are splayed out. Sometimes aardvarks are running, right? Sometimes they're on their hard little backs, right? But it's true that all aardvarks are always in some position, right? But here's the thing. We never talk about the aardvark of a position. We talk about the position of an aardvark, right? We never talk about the substance of an accident. We talk about accidents being of substances, right? So if we want to get at what a color is, we have to be talking about the color of some substance. If we want to talk about what a pain is, we have to be talking about, that's a passion. Um, if we want to be talking, uh, we have to be talking about it being the pain of some substance, right? If we want to talk about the size of something, it's got to be the size of some thing, right? Some substance. So substances exist on their own. Accidents exist in substances. Likewise, some things are in potency, some things are in act. Closed eyes are in potency to seeing. Open eyes are actually seeing. Bricks and mortar lying around are potentially a house. Walls and a roof are actually a house. Sperm and egg are potentially a child. A fertilized egg is actually a child. All of these things in potency, things in act, substances and accidents, all of them are beings. All of them are beings, right? So for the Thomist, if you ask, what is there? There are substances and there are accidents. There are things in potency and there are things in act but they're not all beings in the same way, right? Um, when we say that something in potency is a being, we don't mean exactly the same thing as what we mean when we say that something in act is a being. When we say that a, an accident is a being, we don't mean exactly the same thing as when we say that a substance is a being. To say that an accident is a being is to say something about its dependence upon substance, right? To say that there are such things as positions and colors, right? We can't explain what we mean when we say that, except by making some kind of reference to the dependence that positions and colors have on substances. But to say that a substance is a being is not to say anything about dependence on accidents. Likewise, to say that something in potency is a being is to say something about its dependency on something that's actual. But to say that something actual is a being is not to say anything about it depending on things in potency. So I give you a picture, a chart. This is common being. X-axis, substance and accidents. Y-axis, in act and in potency. So three, four possibilities. You can have actual substances, actual accidents, potential substances, and potential accidents. All of those are. All of those are beings. So, for example, I am an actual substance. My third nephew, I only have two nephews, my third nephew is a potential substance. My breathtaking pedagogical skill is an actual accident, right? I'm exercising it right now, as all of you learn. My breathtaking mathematical skill, sadly, is only a potential accident. Uh, despite my um, hand waving at geometrical proofs, I am not good at math. All of those are parts of being in common or common being, ens communa. But they're ordered parts. Actual accidents depend upon actual substances. Potential substances depend upon actual substances. And potential accidents depend upon actual substances. So everything that counts as a being 
does so because it either is an actual substance or depends upon an actual substance. So when we say that metaphysics is the science of common being, that's what we mean. And when I clarify that common being is the analogical community or the analogical relationship between substance and accidents in potency and in act, that's what I mean. Got it? Great. Formal part of the definition. Metaphysics is the science of what can be known through strictly immaterial principles. So sometimes we know things through principles that are strictly material. Sometimes we know things through principles that are partly material and partly immaterial. And sometimes we know things through principles that are strictly immaterial. What in the world does that mean? Well, knowing things through strictly material principles means knowing them through principles that involve matter both for them to be and for them to be understood. Both to be and to be understood. Knowing things through principles that are partly material, partly immaterial, means knowing them through principles that involve matter to be, but not to be understood. So there's some things that you can understand without thinking matter, and yet those things can't exist unless they exist in matter. Um, and don't worry, we will get to examples. Last. Knowing things through strictly immaterial principles means knowing them through principles that involve matter neither to be nor to be understood. Here come those examples. Oh, first, the first way of knowing is physical knowledge. The second is mathematical knowledge, and the third is metaphysical knowledge. So, cow, the thing that you milk, right? Um, Cow is a physical concept, right? The concept cow is a physical concept. Why? Because it requires matter both for the concept to be instantiated, both for there to be cows out there, and for us to understand the concept, right? So there are no immaterial cows, right? Um, all cows are and must be material cows. Um, and you can't even understand the concept cow unless you are understanding material things, right? So cows have to have udders that you, you know, squeeze to get milk, right? They have to have four legs. Um, they've got little ears, right? Um, you can think about the sounds that they make, right? All of those involve materiality. So materiality is involved in the concept cow and it's required for there to be cows. But what about something like half? or two. Those are mathematical concepts because they do require matter to be instantiated, right? If there are going to be two of something, there has to be matter involved, right? That's how you divide them. Um, so for there to be two chairs, you divide them. For one chair to be half of another chair, right, um, is involves materiality. You have to divide it. Nevertheless, you can understand mathematical concepts without invoking matter, right? So um, it's true that all circles, right? If you actually have a sphere, the sphere's got to be made of something, right? It's got to be made of bronze or marble or clay or whatever, right? Wood, um, whatever you like, right? If there's going to be a sphere, it's got to be instantiated in matter. But for us to understand the concept of sphere, we don't have to invoke any kind of matter at all, right? You can understand the mathematical definition of a sphere without understanding matter, right? It's not, a, materiality isn't involved in that. Actual is a metaphysical concept since it requires matter neither to be instantiated nor to be understood, right? So something can be actual without being material, God, right? The angels. Um, nevertheless, it's also not the case that you um, need matter in order to understand them, right? When you understand these concepts, um, no materiality is involved. 
So to understand something metaphysically is to understand it in terms of things like actuality. To understand things mathematically is to understand them in terms of things like half, double, two, three, sphere, square, right? To understand something physically is to understand it in terms of things like cows. You with me? Cool. Okay, here are some examples. So first, an example of physical reasoning. All animals have tactile organs and a nervous system. Everything with tactile organs and a nervous system is irritable in the technical sense of irritable. So all animals are irritable. That's physical reasoning. Mathematical reasoning. All triangles are shapes. All shapes are bound continuous quantities. So all triangles are bound continuous quantities. Here's an example of metaphysical reasoning. All actualities are more perfect than their corresponding potentialities. All forms are actualities. So all forms are more perfect than their corresponding potentialities. Notice all the terms involved in the first example of reasoning, animal, tactile organs in a nervous system, irritable, all of those are physical terms. They, require, they involve materiality both when we understand them and when they exist. All the terms in the second example, triangle, shape, bound, continuous quantity, are mathematical terms, right? They require matter if they're going to be, but they don't require matter to be understood. All the terms in the third example, actuality, being more perfect than a corresponding potentiality, and form are metaphysical terms. Those involve materiality neither, uh, at least necessarily, neither for their existence nor for their understanding. Now I'm going to push you a little bit. We're going to look at some harder cases. What kind of reasoning do you think that is? So some substances are corruptible. Everything corruptible is changeable. So some substances are changeable. Just show of hands, gut reaction, who thinks that's physical reasoning? I'll do that just a second. Great, yeah, good, you. Um, who thinks that's metaphysical reasoning? I got some. Who thinks that's mathematical reasoning? I got no one. Oh, I got one for that. Okay. So by way of um, gesturing at how to adjudicate, notice that in the first case, the major term, that's the unique term in the first premise or the major premise. The major term substance, that's, ma that's metaphysical, right? Substances, you don't have to understand materiality to understand substances, and um, you don't need materiality for there to be substances. That's metaphysical. But the middle term, so that's the term that both the major premise and the minor premise have, the middle term, corruptible, and the minor term, the term that's unique to the minor premise, changeable, both of those are physical, right? They involve materiality both in order to be understood and in order to be. I haven't yet answered what kind of reasoning that is. Here's another example, also harder. All cats are composites of essence and existence. No composite of essence and existence are simple. No composites, plural, are simple. So no cats are simple. Raise your hand if you think that's physical reasoning. I got one, I got two, I got three. You are contradicting yourself, Father Simon. This is wonderful. Good. Um, so you see this stuff is hard, right? Um, so who thinks it's metaphysical reasoning? Okay, I see a lot more hands there. Um, anybody think it's math? Don't raise your hands. <laughs> okay, cool. Notice here, it's the inverse of the first case. The major term, cat, is physical. You can't understand what cats are and there can't, and cats can't exist without matter. But the middle term and the minor term, those are metaphysical. You don't actually require matter either to understand what they mean or um, for there to be such things. I still haven't told you what kind of reasoning that is. One more case. Some forms actualize unstable compounds subject to radioactive decay. 
All unstable compounds subject to radioactive decay are things. So some forms actualize things. Who thinks that's metaphysical reasoning? I got one, I got two. Oh, we got the trifecta right there. Okay. Um, who thinks that's physical reasoning? I got one. Anybody for math? Don't raise your hands. Okay, <laughs> cool. So now notice in this third case, the major and the minor terms are metaphysical, but the middle term is physical. So now I'm going to give you the Thomistic answer and the Thomistic principle for the answer. The principle is this. When we reason, the middle term, the term that's shared in both the major and the minor premises, that's the thing that makes the bit of reasoning work, right? Um, the middle term is the most important one, right? Um, and so that's going to be the thing that decides the character of how we know the conclusion, even though the middle term doesn't show up in the conclusion, right? Um, you cut out the middleman when you reason. Nevertheless, it's that middle term, that middleman, that tells you what sort of reasoning you just did. Um, so I propose to you this. This is a case of metaphysical reasoning. All cats are composites of essence and existence. No composites of essence and existence are simple, so no cats are simple. Why is that metaphysical reasoning as opposed to physical reasoning, right? Aren't cats physical things? Sure, absolutely. They totally are, right? But Cats, like everything else in the universe, fall under common being, right? Cats are particular instances of either actual or potential substances, right? But here's the thing. When you go through that line of thought, the thing that's doing all the work is the notion, a composition of essence and existence. And that's metaphysical. So when I reason to the conclusion that cats are simple because they are composites of essence and existence. I'm understanding cats metaphysically, right? So it's possible for us to understand physical things metaphysically, just like it's possible for us to understand physical things mathematically, right? I can take a bronze sphere and I can ask, what is the diameter of the sphere, right? I'm reasoning about that physical thing, but I'm not reasoning about it in, in a physical way. I'm reasoning about it in a mathematical way. So too, we can reason about anything in a metaphysical way. That happens when the middle term, the principle of our reasoning is strictly immaterial. So if the middle term is strictly material, the reasoning is physical. If the middle term is partly material, partly mathematical, the reasoning is mathematical. Uh, that should be, sorry. Yeah, partly material, partly immaterial then it's mathematical reasoning. And if the middle term is strictly immaterial, the reasoning is metaphysical. You got me? So that's what it means to say that metaphysics is the science of what can be known through strictly immaterial principles, right? We can reason about things where the way in which we're, we're reasoning is a metaphysical way of reasoning, right? And literally what that means is that the middle term, the thing that's really the workhorse in our line of thought is a, is a metaphysical concept. Cool. Now, metaphysics, mathematics, and the philosophy of nature. So we've said for the Thomist, metaphysics is the science of common being, that is the analogical community of substance and accidents in potency and in act, insofar as this can be known through strictly immaterial principles. Well, guess what? We can now give perfectly parallel definitions of mathematics and natural philosophy. Mathematics is the science of quantified being insofar as this can be known through principles that are partly material and partly immaterial. And natural philosophy is the science of changeable being insofar as this can be known through strictly material principles. So each discipline is distinct and autonomous with its own proper domain, right? So the domain of metaphysics is common being, the domain of mathematics is quantified being, and the domain of natural philosophy is changeable being. And each one has its own unique perspective, its own unique way of investigating or way of reasoning, right? Um, so in a strictly immaterial way for metaphysics, 
in a partly material way for mathematics and in a strictly material way for natural philosophy. So how do they relate? Ooh, that's not supposed to be there, boom. Okay, natural philosophy is actually the best fit for the human mind. So natural philosophy, I wanna suggest is where we start. Um, and we work through natural philosophy and mathematics towards metaphysics. Why? Because all of our knowledge comes from the senses. And what comes from the senses is changeable. So the proper knowledge of what's changeable, that's gonna be physical knowledge, right? So natural philosophy is kind of the, um, it's our first way of accessing the truths about the world around us. And yet everything changeable can also be known mathematically and metaphysically. Why? Well, because every changeable being is also a quantified being and every changeable being is a being, right? So um, every changeable being can be known either in the way that mathematics knows it or in the way that metaphysics knows it. Um, so natural philosophy is like the perfect stepping stone, right? It's the first step that's easy to take and it sets us up for going deeper. Um, so in a sense, we can think of metaphysics as what's beneath all the various branches of science and mathematics. The more you dig into them, right, the more you get down to what are these principles, what is a cow, um, well, eventually you're going to get to, well, a cow's a substance, right? And whose job is it to explain what a substance is? Not the natural philosopher. Why? Because substance is a metaphysical concept, right? So the metaphysician is going to kind of come in where the natural philosopher ends, Right? The natural philosopher digging deeper and deeper and deeper into changeable things is going to hit a kind of metaphysical rock bottom. So to switch analogies, to mix metaphors, just as all roads lead to Rome, all learning leads to metaphysics. Metaphysics supports the other disciplines, but it doesn't dominate them. It respects their autonomy. So don't be afraid of metaphysics. Thanks.